My name's Sean Larson. I'm the Senior Vice President for the American Farmland Trust. Hold it down, Jeff. Um, we have a, uh, just a tremendous panel this morning to talk about the, the beginning of the food system. Farmers are the backbone of this country. They are the ones that have provided us with the things that we actually need. I can remember years ago farming with my dad and trying to figure out what is it we're going to grow that people want. Because for some reason, we've also kind of lost this idea of need being important. So we're going to talk today about how production agriculture can be a huge part of the solution to food loss and waste. But it's going to take everybody coming together through the entire supply chain to make that happen. One of the things that I, I really want us to focus on uh, as, as we get to the end of this session, and we'll have hopefully a chance for y'all to ask some questions, is recognizing the considerations that farmers are making to address food loss and waste in their operations and how those differ in different production segments. Second piece is recognizing the role that upstream manufacturers and retailers play in helping farms maximize their profitability, that's why they do it, but then also the full use of the products that they grow. And then finally, become aware of the current opportunities to engage to address the topic of food loss and waste from that farm level. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, have our panelists introduce themselves. Well, good afternoon. My name is Rod Snyder, and I serve as senior advisor for agriculture to uh, the administrator, uh, the head of EPA, Administrator Michael Regan. Um, in this capacity, I've uh, been in this role for a year and a half uh, as part of the Biden administration. I'm a political appointee. Uh, in this capacity, I help um, advise the administrator on any food or ag-related issues that come before uh, the agency. And um, food loss and food waste is certainly one of a number of different topics that uh, comes across my desk. Does that work? There we go. Hi, everyone. Lee Prezkov. Um, I'm a senior program officer at World Wildlife Fund on their food loss and waste team. And for those of you who aren't familiar, our food loss and waste team is organized in a few different pillars that we cover. In fact, my colleagues are speaking right now on the schools panel because we do a lot of work in schools and then food service and hospitality. Um, but I've always managed our, um, our work that's focused on farms around post-harvest loss and through the supply chain, and that we've been doing that work for about six years now. Um, and yeah, like I said, we're really integrated across all sectors, though. My name is Nicole Partridge. I am with FPL Food in Augusta, Georgia. I am their chief financial officer. I've been there six, well, actually this will be finishing my seventh year. Um, I started off on the live operations side with the farms. We are a family owned, vertically, vertically integrated beef processor in Augusta, Georgia. Um, and we strive to find ways to reduce waste, to recycle, to be sustainable, and to make profitability, not just for us, but for our partners in the, in the farmers as well. Um, I'm Hallie Schaffner. I'm a rice farmer in Arkansas, in the Mississippi Delta region of Arkansas. Um, I'm the sixth generation of my family to farm uh, that land, and uh, we grow about a thousand acres of rice and about a thousand acres of soybeans. Um, and I'm just really happy to be here today. We're working really hard on the farm on coming up with some solutions. Uh, to reduce food loss in terms of, for us, that is crop loss, so loss of crops in the field. So excited to be here. Thank you all. Um, so as I said, I'm John Larson, Senior Vice President of the American Farmland Trust. If you don't know the trust, you probably have seen this before. So years ago, we as an organization really came to the realization that without farms, we don't have food. And although it's a very negative statement, it does drive home a point. And so I brought a few with me. There's some on the tables. If you want to grab them, please do. 
Uh, they go really well on a bumper, but they also they look pretty cool on a beer fridge. Not that I know, but. Um, so my role at AFT is, um, as senior vice president, is to, to really bring to light how our programs across the country, we have about 180 staff across the country that uh, really focus on kind of three pillars to our mission. And that's around the obvious one around farmland protection. Having a more strategic ability to see and know where we're going to grow the food that we need in the future. And, and, and along that line, growing it in a way that is the second pillar that meets the needs of the environment. Very much uh, engaged in the climate discussion, very much engaged in the regenerative agriculture discussion, and, and really looking at it through the lens of science. And, and doing research to show that soil health is the premise by which productivity and resiliency are built. And so the final uh, leg of the stool is keeping farmers on the land. And as I alluded to a minute ago, profitability is how we do that. And, and making sure that a, uh, a farmer can make a living on that land that he is entrusted to steward. Um, as a, as a uh, early retired farmer, um, that was a decision that my banker and my wife made for me. My wife hates it when I play the lottery. She's afraid I'd go back to farming. Um, it is one of those things that is near and dear to my heart um, because I know uh, that it is a very noble pursuit and it's one that we absolutely need. And we can do a better job, folks. We can, we can provide the necessary tools and resources to make farmers profitable, but also resilient and able to meet the needs of climate in the future. So um, I, I was excited when Sean asked me to come and moderate this session, especially when I saw the quality of our panelists. And so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rod. Well, thanks, John. Um, so I'm going to just start off the conversation uh, at, a, at a pretty high level um, to talk a little bit more about the Biden-Harris administration's overall posture and leadership on this issue. And then I think we'll start, we're actually sort of positioned on the stage to get more detailed, I think, as we go through the conversation. But I'll start by saying something that I think everyone in the room knows, which is that in 2015, EPA and USDA collectively um, set the, the, the first ever kind of public target of reducing uh, food loss and food waste by 50% by the year 2030. And uh, I'm not the best at math, but by my, my calculation, we're about halfway uh, through that 15 year runway right now. And so, um, you know, I think there's a sense of urgency amongst the federal government that in order to accelerate progress, it's a really critical period of time for us. Um, a couple of, of recent actions that um, I think are worth noting. First of all, um, for the first time in almost 50 years, um, uh, the, the administration hosted a, a conference last September on hunger, nutrition, and health at the White House. Um, and uh, some of you all may have been there. It was a very big event. Others were, were watching online. But um, I was very interested in the action report that came out associated with that, with that conference. And amongst the many different items that were flagged as priorities um, was a, a brief section on reducing barriers to food recovery. Um, and so uh, flagging that within a sort of a national strategy like that I think was important to sort of say this is among the things that, as administration, we're, we're going to prioritize. Um, since that time, the White House has conducted a food loss and waste interagency policy committee um, between EPA, USDA, FDA, and a number of other, other federal agencies um, to figure out how we stack hands and use a whole of government approach um, to drive towards this 2030 goal that we're all very committed to. And the other important thing to mention is that, um, and we can get a bit more specific about this through the course of the conversation, but we're also, I think, as everyone is aware, facing a moment in which we have unprecedented funding that potentially could be used to help accelerate this work, both through the bipartisan infrastructure law and then more recently through the Inflation Reduction Act, which just that President Biden signed into law at the early fall of last year. And in these instances, there are some key opportunities. Um, that could help us um, accelerate work, and I'll, I'll, we'll, I'll save some of that for as we go through the conversation, but I think these are all uh, making it a very important moment for all of us to be able to make progress. 
I'd like to start with why is the panda working on food loss and waste? And we are a conservation organization. But I think I'm speaking to a group who knows that food loss and waste touches on so many parts of the environment. We know that of all greenhouse gas emissions in the food production system, that food loss and waste accounts for over half of those. When we grow food and raise it to the point of maturity and send it through the supply chain, we are wasting water and valuable resources it took to raise that product. So it's a climate issue. It's a natural resource issue. Nearly 700 million people in the world are hungry. It's a food security issue. So WWF has always been very invested in food loss and waste. And as I mentioned, we've been specifically looking at the farm level because as we know, ReFed has put out amazing data through the years, but the data on farms was always coming simply from grower estimates. And so we took it upon ourselves to go into the field and actually start measuring. And that's what we've been doing for the past six years. And of course, we are trying to get away from that by developing metrics for growers to use and integrating those metrics in you know, widely used reporting platforms. But we still just somehow always manage to be in the field with farmers, working with them to measure and understand the opportunity that's still left in their fields, what the financial viability is of that for, again, a lot of the things that we've heard today, you know, upcycling, donation, of course, just using things for maybe animal feed, other um, channels. So measurement is just, you know, we like to say what gets measured gets managed. It's a huge part of our work. It continues to be a, a gap in research. It's something that was talked about in this group earlier today over and over again. Um, it continues to be very burdensome to growers because there's so many asks of them in terms of data and reporting. So how can we make sure that that's consistent with what's already out there in terms of reporting? And then of course, how can we make measurement easy? Because measurement does need to happen because again, it shows we have seen that loss in fields tends to be significantly greater once it's measured than what growers generally estimate. And that is not to the fault of growers, that is because Everyone has a different definition of what is being lost or wasted in the field. Um, so yeah, that's, I'll hand it over to you. I can go on forever. Um, so my perspective is a little bit different. We are, I'm in animal agriculture instead of say plant agriculture. Um, but we are, we do have three affiliated farms with FPL um, that make up we have roughly 3,500 acres in Georgia and about 800 acres in Texas. And now the acreage, we produce crops for our cattle, we have a breeding herd, and we have fed cattle. Um, and we're about, in our processes, processes, putting the product back into the land. Um, again, the sustainability, green. And it does cost money, but we have found that with working with the local producers and in communicating with them, in building partnerships, it helps make it a lot better instead of trying to force something down on them. Um, we strive to make the highest quality product through responsible agricultural and business practices and working with the local communities and the farmers. Um, but you know, at the farm level, we seek ways with other companies to buy their byproducts you know, that, that would otherwise go to the landfill. Um, and I'll talk about that a little more later. And then at the plant level where we actually pr produce the cattle or process the cattle, if you think about it, you've got, so let's just say a 1,200 pound cow coming in at a dollar a pound. Um, you process that cattle, only about 40% of that cow is meat, okay? And if you're only focused on selling that meat, that just increased your price from a dollar a pound to 250 a pound. Okay, and that's without any labor or anything, anything else into it. So we have to find ways to distribute the other, and other channels to distribute that product to be profitable and to decrease our um, output to the landfill. So we're not throwing all that away. Um, so that's, and that's what we really strive to do. We work with medical industries, um, w with petroleum industries, things like that. So. We just really try to keep things in the process and recognizing the economics of it as well and not throwing anything, you know, reducing waste. Most of the, most of the rice that we grow on our farm is consumed. It ends up on, on someone's table. And I think economically for a farm, we're not 
any different than anybody else in the food chain in terms of the food supply chain in terms of we are focused on the quantity and the quality of the food we provide that's going to be true for you know food buyers it's going to be true for grocery stores but because we are the origin story um, any loss that occurs at origination is impossible to regain you cannot conjure food out of thin air so when i think of Food loss, I am thinking about the single biggest risk that we face as farmers, and that is climate change. I took over my family's farm in 2016, and every year since that time, we have experienced at least one extreme weather event that has affected either the quantity or quality of the crop that we had in the field. I'm gonna give two examples. Um, in terms of quantity, in 2019, 2020, uh, we had some epic flooding from you know the the north part of the Midwest down to Louisiana, 20 million crop acres, just productive cropland went unplanted. One million of those was in my state. And to give you some context, one million acres of rice in Arkansas has the potential to feed every person on this planet 30 times, times 20. Another so that's quantity. Quality is another issue. So last year we experienced an epic drought. There's a lot of epics in terms of climate change. That was nationwide, but in Arkansas, it really hit the rice industry. And not that we actually experienced a significant yield loss because we can irrigate and we have plenty of water in our area. What it did was the sustained uh, levels of temperature at night, as well as a lack of rain, caused damage during the reproductive stage of the rice plant, and it reduced what we call the milling quality. So when the rice is run through a mill, um, the grains, if they have been, uh, if the quality has been affected, they will break apart. And sometimes that is thrown out as trash, and sometimes that just gets redirected to a food byproduct like pet food. But farmers are paid on the quantity and quality of the product that we provide. So if something happens that it causes, causes loss in either of these two areas, we do not get paid. And when we do not get paid, we don't make it. We'll go bankrupt, we'll stop farming, or worse. Farmers make up only 1% of the whole labor force, but we have the highest suicide rate of any industry. So when we talk about food loss, we're talking about crop loss. As a farmer, I am very hopeful because there is a revolution going on um, with the help of our government agencies and, um, uh, and the, the funding that has recently been put out there. Um, and also from food buyers themselves, so the, the big names in the industry like Riceland or Tyson's. Uh, they're all getting together and they're saying, you know what, there's a better way we can do this. There's a better way we can provide sustainable food uh, to um, the American consumer. And farmers, we want to participate in that. A, because we can mitigate risk. We can reduce the amount of loss that we experience in the field. And B, we can become more environmentally friendly. So we can reduce the carbon emissions that we are creating on our farm, which can be considerable. So... I'm very hopeful, and I, we can talk about this more later, and they know, of course, but some of the things we're working on on our farm is we're working on reduced tillage. So the reducing the amount of carbon we release into the atmosphere when we run our tractors through. Uh, that's also a focus on soil health. Um, we focus on water conservation using technologies. We use GPS technologies on our sprayers to conserve our resources and reduce our fertilizer and herbicide outputs. I am very hopeful. The thing I like to talk about is the, the American consumer, the average American consumer, has little to no relationship with where their food comes from. And that is to the detriment of them, but also to the detriment of farmers. Because if something happens to the food supply chain and you don't have the information to advocate for yourself or for the people who are growing it, you cannot address the problem. So that is, that is really what I think um, things like this conference are great for, is just to have, have these great conversations. So I have a couple of questions for each of you, and we'll go through those, and then we'll open it up uh, to questions from the floor. So Rod, you talked about uh, infrastructure bill, you talked about IRA, you talked about some of the, the, you know, just the 
timing and necessity for action. Um, what is um, this administration doing in relationship to, um, how do we quantify some of that? And then, you know, what are some of the specifics about the funding and the programs that are available to folks to uh, be involved? So, thanks, John. Um, I, a couple things here that are worth noting, and, and some of you all who might have been in the, the, the climate breakout session this morning heard from my colleague Shannon Kenny uh, from EPA's Office of Research and Development, and she was part of um, authoring a report uh, at the end of 2021 um, uh, called From Farm to Kitchen, The Environmental Impacts of U.S. Food Waste. And I know that um, Refed and lots of folks in the room uh, likely participated in or have used that report over the last year and a half since it came out. but. I like to cite some of the top line findings because it is so striking. Um, first is that, uh, and putting it in terms that the average consumer I think can understand, um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with food loss and waste, uh, basically the equivalent of 42 coal fired power plants. Um, it's enough water and energy for 50 million uh, households. Um, 140 million acres of land uh, basically that that, that production goes goes wasted, which is the equivalent of essentially the entire land mass of California and New York combined. Um, these are things that this report tried to surface as, as a conversation starter to say the magnitude of the problem is really, really significant and, ne and it needs a, a similar response from all of us in terms of how we address it. And I know Shannon mentioned this morning as well, but um, there's some updated work that's coming later this summer looking specifically at some of the methane, um, specific uh, methane impacts um, to, to quantify those uh, in a more uh, precise way. That's a peer-reviewed report that I think is coming out this summer that a lot of folks are very interested in. Um, in response to, to all of this, um, there have been some new funding opportunities uh, that, have, that have come forward uh, under the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, EPA specifically uh, had $140 million that's looking at post-consumer waste insights and education and infrastructure. Um, USDA is really the agency that's leading on the upstream portion uh, at the farm level, and they have um, some recent funding opportunities around composting and sustainable ag systems that um, if, if anyone wants to get more information on, I can certainly connect you with the right people at, at USDA who are leading on some of those um, uh, funding application opportunities. Um, another area that's specifically around climate that's a big, big chunk of money that, that we have announced as part of the Inflation Reduction Act are Climate po Pollution Reduction Grants, CPRG. It's a $5 billion, with a B, pot of money um, that is going to be going out to states and munis municipalities and other partners um, over the course of the next year um, that's looking at a whole, the, across lots and lots of greenhouse gas reduction opportunities, but food systems um, are certainly part of that conversation. It's not exclusive to that, but $5 billion can go a long way at, start to, at starting to tackle a lot of these issues. So what I think I would encourage everyone to do around this CPRG pot of funding is um, uh, specifically to begin to reach out to some of the state leaders um, because these monies are not going to come directly from EPA. They're going to be allocated to the states as well as to uh, municipalities. Um, and they will, they're actually right now working on their implementation plans associated with um, this $5 billion pot. And I think almost every single state, uh, not, not all 50, but almost all 50 states have opted in. Um, and later this year, um, those funding applications will begin to emerge uh, with, um, I think, funding uh, with projects really not emerging until 2024. But right now is the time to begin to inquire about this because uh, food loss and waste um, strategies could be a part of that broader um, climate pol pollution reduction grant opportunity that's coming. So, Lee, one of the things that, uh, that I heard you say is that measurement is important. And so with that, are there tools that are available to farmers to be able to measure? Um, and then also along that same line, how does that measurement then translate to the retailer, the manufacturer, and the other actors in the food production system and the supply chain? Yeah, so uh, about two years ago, we started working with the Stewardship Index for Specialty Crops to develop a food loss metric. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with CISC, CISC is built up of 
uh, retailers, processors, uh, farmers. Um, they are at the base of CISC's steering committees and advisory committees. And so we started working with CISC to develop a food loss metric that we piloted with farmers. We had farmers provide feedback on, um, and that is now live. Uh, it's both publicly available on CISC, CISC's website, and then it's available for buyers, retailers, and aggregators on CropTrack. Um, but additionally, we are working on developing a global food loss metric uh, with the help of RAP in the UK um, and also our, U our WWF UK office that is going to um, eventually also report into scope three emissions platforms using either emission factors from groups like Refed or um, our partners at Bing and Ongen, um, using the ACE calculator. Um, and then we are working with companies on integrating that food loss metric into existing reporting platforms, as I mentioned. We don't want this to be a standalone tool. The point is that this will feed into existing platforms such as WRI's Food Waste Atlas. Um, there's also the um, Sustainability Food Trust's uh, existing global farm metrics. This will feed into that. So that it will be a one-stop shop for growers, um, processors, companies uh, to use. And right now we're actually trialing, it went live or went live in beta this week and we are trialing it with members of Consumer Goods Forum. So retailers like Walmart, Tesco, Sainsbury's, uh, Migros, um, there's a couple more I'm gonna forget, but about seven different members of Consumer Goods Forum who are gonna be trialing this tool with us for the next uh, six to eight months. Um, and you know, everything we do at WWF is public. We will be putting out you know, business cases. We will be anonymizing and aggregating this data. We will be sharing it with Refed. It'll go into their um, insights engine. So those are, are two tools that come to mind. And to you know, not confuse, I, I still think using the CISC metric is best for US producers. Um, we are working on a way to kind of integrate the two, the global food loss metric tool and the CISC metric to make sure that they talk to each other. Um, but at least right now, the CISC tool is, is very much alive. Growers are using it. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about that later on. Thanks, Lee. Um, one follow-up question on that is just when you look at the recommendations that you guys give to farmers working with them in the field, how does that kind of facilitate a conversation with the retailer about sustainability? Say that that is something we are always going to be working on um, through comp through groups like Pacific Coast Food Waste Commitment, which we are involved in. You know, we are going to be facilitating conversations with with retailers and businesses about what we find in these beta trials and what support growers need to consistently measure year after year, so that we can actually have trends to have targeted interventions that have been d discussed the past three days at this conference. Um, but that is, that, that is one of the biggest challenges, is making sure that data is transparent and communicated up and down the supply chain. Um, but really, what this tool also shows is the financial opportunity for growers to go back into the field and get that product out. And so I think that would be really interesting to retailers and buyers as well, who will be more interested in the tool through that. Thank you. Nicole. So um, the so Circular economy around uh, animal agriculture has been a priority for a lot of operations, as you talked about utilizing the entire animal. Um, what's FBL doing around this, and how does that translate into your unique role as the CFO when you look at it through the lens of what a bottom line strategy is for FBL? At FPL, we want to do what's right simply because it's right. But if it happens to give us an increase in our bottom line, then that's a big win. <laughs> We're always looking for that opportunity. And as CFO, I will tell you, anybody at the plant will tell you there's going to be two questions that I'm going to ask them when they come to me about anything. How much is it going to cost and what's the ROI? Um, so they're, they're fully prepared. And I can tell you at the farm level, we do some several things. We do buy, buy, buy products from manufacturers for some of our feed um, that are very nutritional for the cattle and help in, improve their gains. We get brewer's yeast from brewer, brewing companies. We get um, corn gluten. We use cornhole seeds. 
Um, we use DDGs from ethanol plants. I mean, these things would otherwise go into the landfill if we didn't, if they didn't have another outlet. Um, we recycle our bedding. We have barns uh, back up. We have some monoslope barns in one of our farms. And in those barns, we have bedding that we use um, shavings, wheat straw, corn stalks. And it, once we clean out the pen, those, um, that manure actually goes into a manure separator where we separate the solids from the liquids. The solids will then be put back onto the land to put the nutrients back in the soil from where we have grown our crops, the, the forage to give to the cattle. So we're not, taking, not just taking from the land, we're putting back into the land. Um, and then the liquid is separated, it goes into the pivot. So we're recycling the water instead of pulling more water. Um, and it is, and in turn, we have increased the nutrients that are given to our cattle, reduced their number of days on feed, reduced their cost. We have reduced the amount of synthetic fertilizers that we're putting on the uh, land by roughly 20 to 25%. And we have improved our crop yield by roughly the same percentage. So it's a win-win all the way around. Then at the FPL level, we have a rendering plant um, where a lot of the non-meat products go in there and it's separated into tallow, which is your fat, and then your meat and bone meal. Um, the tallow goes to, um, is sold for rene uh, renewable energy. And then the meat and bone meal is used in feed and fertilizer. Um, and then from the rendering plant perspective, instead of costing roughly $1,000 per truckload to go to the landfill and taking up space, this is roughly, it gives us roughly $60 per head revenue. Now, just to let you do the math, we process roughly 5,500 head per week, okay, in 52 weeks a year. That's a good amount of money. You're sending that to another place and not to the landfill. Um, the veins on the cattle, we use those for um, surgeries for children. We use um, the fetal blood in medical. Um, and also the blood that we have from the cattle, that goes into a centrifuge. The liquid then is separate, you know, it's separated. You've got the liquid that goes into the water, is put in a tank and set back to the farm to put back on the land. And then the solids are then further processed and made into meal, blood meal for uh, feed. So, I mean, we're just everything, and it all adds to the bottom line. We're reducing our cost, improving our revenue, saving landfill, um, and just that whole cycle process. Thank you. Hallie. We had, I, I kept getting her name wrong earlier, so I'm trying really hard. Um, you talked about the relationship between and what food loss and yield loss mean. Um, elaborate a little bit more on that, but then also can you tell us how you're tracking and watching your progress to assure your production of rice and grains is maximized? The name of the game for farmers, uh, shoot, this would be all businesses, but the name of the game is do more with less. Um, you know, it's our goal to use as little land as few herbicides, as little water as possible to maximize the amount of food that we grow. Um, I grow a uh, thousand acres of rice and a thousand acres of soybeans and that probably sounds like a big farm to y'all but it, in our area it's not. Uh, an acre being approximately a football field, my neighbors are eight to twenty thousand football field operations and it's, interest, it's an interesting ecosystem uh, in, in my county because, of course, we all know everybody else's business. I mean, we're mostly, <laughs> <laughs> we're mostly related. So, <laughs> so when something happens to one of us, you can see the trends uh, cascading down every farm. So when I talk about um, food loss as yield loss, um, I'm not just saying that climate change is affecting us in terms of yield loss uh, because I believe in science, which I do, but also because I can see it with my own eyes. Farmers can see it every day. And what's interesting is that you may not find a lot of farmers who will say climate change is caused by humans, it is. but you will find a lot of farmers saying now 
climate change is happening, we have to do something about it regardless of why. That is where I find a lot of hope, and that's kind of where what we're doing on our farm comes in. So we are taking some lessons from the Midwest. The Midwest uh, is a little more advanced than the, mis the Mid-South when it comes to some of these conservation practices, but in the vein of trying to do more with less, we want to maximize the, say, number of pounds I can get off an acre, a number of pounds of rice, um, and we can use technology to sense exactly how much water we're putting on that acre of rice. So it's no longer a guessing game. Oh, you know, this, wa this, this rice, you know, it needs to be flooded now. Uh, you know, we don't have enough moisture in the ground. Now I can actually put sensors in the ground and there's an app on my phone that tells me, oh, you know what, you should probably water or, oh, you know what, you don't need any right now. That saves us a ton of money. Um, another good example we're doing on our farm is we're converting all of our wells to electric. Electric wells have a lot more efficiency than diesel wells. It also reduces our carbon output because if you burn diesel, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. Um, another thing we're working on is we're trying to go, um, we're trying to get away from synthetic fertilizers. Um, plants, uh, soybeans and, and rice and corn, they need potassium um, and phosphorus. And uh, we can now get that from chicken litter. So we have chicken litter trucked from the houses down to the farm and we spread it out over our fields before we even plant. We integrate it into the soil if we can and we don't need synthetic fertilizers. Um, well, at least we don't need synthetic potassium and phosphorus. Um, there are other things that, that we're doing in terms of soil health. Um, soil health is incredible incredibly, incredibly important because the healthier our soils are, the less carbon emissions we have, the better yields we can get. Um, you talked a lot about that. Uh, a lot of that, again, is reducing the amount of times we put a tractor in the field, which is fantastic because A, we're not releasing carbon into the atmosphere. B, I'm not spending money on diesel, time, equipment wear and tear. Every time that I don't have to put a tractor in there is money in my pocket. That is very attractive to farmers is if you can do more with less, you can make more money and save more money and your margin is better, which in, in terms of the climate crisis, market volatility is one of the biggest enemies. So those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, there are a lot of farms around me that are, are doing even more interesting things. They're testing out using drones um, for spraying uh, instead of putting a big, a big sprayer in the field. Um, they, they're now employing these new fertilizer trucks that can put out fertilizer only where you need it. Again, that is eliminating this guessing game. Oh, I have to put out synthetic nitrogen, let's just blanket apply it. No, now we can only put it where we need it. Same thing with herbicides. So I think that farmers are really stepping up to the plate. It's in our best interest to step up to the plate. Um, to produce more food, use fewer resources, improve the environment, make ourselves more sustainable. And I think our hope is that other industries, other carbon emitting industries will look at us and say, we see you, we see the risks that you are facing, um, we see what you are doing and we will also do better. Absolutely. Sorry. Just to add to that point, and I, I want to say that w nature comes back quickly. And we're, we're doing a study to understand the implications of loss for farms that are transitioning to more sustainable practices. Dare I use the term regenerative, but you know, whatever that umbrella term means at this point in time. And so from what Hallie is saying and you know, wanting to make the best use out of what they have right now, you know, and not necessarily expanding your agricultural footprint for a greater yield, but just being more efficient. You know, we, we kind of made an assumption that we thought we'd see loss increase at the beginning as farms transition to more sustainable and regenerative practices. But so far in this work, that is not what we are seeing. We are seeing after one year of reduced tillage or planting pollinator habitats between orchard rows that it is improving yield quickly. Um, which has just been a really fascinating um, uh, result so far from that work. So, I, I could go for that. 
Absolutely, because uh, we started our chicken litter application uh, three years ago, and we've already seen an increase in organic matter, and we save about $100 an acre on synthetic fertilizer. So it, it works. So this is where I go off script. Um, so a lot of the things that you talked about were really expensive. When you talk about precision agriculture and the tools that it takes, those are capital outlays. Those are things that you have to invest in. My question to the group in here is, are those kind of transition and those kind of products that you have confidence have been grown in such a way that it meets those kind of long-term goals, is that of more value to you? I guess a show of hands of those who think it is. The, 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 sure, so she's using less fertilizer, she's using less herbicides because she's putting them exactly where the pests that she needs to control are. That is extremely expensive to do. It takes a change in the equipment. It, cha it takes a change in the management. And a lot of the time, what we're talking about is not necessarily um, a huge difference in the ability for the equipment to do it. It's an ability of the individual, the amount of time that they have to make those kind of management decisions. And so my question is, if you know that that is the way that she's doing it, are you willing to pay more for the product that she produces? Yes. In, in the she long is. run. Yes, in the long run. The 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 challenge the challenge is um, when you are growing a commodity that goes into a commodity sales uh, system, you're getting paid whatever the market dictates at that point in time. What I'm asking is, are we willing to pay more for that which you know is grown more sustainably? So I 100% agree, kind of the reason I asked the question, thank you, because I tell you what, I've only been able to be here just today, and I've learned a ton. It has been extremely informational for me, and it's really generated an interest in my ability to use food loss and waste as a conversation within farmland protection and doing good conservation on farm. Um, and so... It is, I think it's really important for us to all be um, kind of unafraid. If you're getting on a plane this afternoon, I challenge you to talk to the person next to you. Um, I don't like to do that. I get tired of talking to people. Um, but it's really important as the people that are engaged to engage. Um. Back to the question about... Um consumers being willing to pay more for what we're doing. So farmers are very cash poor. Uh, the way that we run our business is that we make no money for the first three quarters, and then we make all of our money at the very end. So we are operating on financing. So whenever we make a decision to upgrade a piece of equipment so that we can be more sustainable, um, I'll use a, a good example is we are moving our farm. Half of our farm is going to go to what's called minimum till. That means we are not going to be plowing up the soil every single year, and that is fantastic for, for the environment and for us. And yes, we will absolutely save money on diesel time and machinery, but it costs me $25,000 to do that. Now, $25,000 that I'm putting on a crop loan or maybe using up a little equity that I don't know that I can spare because I don't know what the weather's going to do, I don't know how the yield is going to be. I have to think about how am I going to pay that off at the end of the year or how am I going to finance that over three to five years. So when we ask consumers, are you going to pay more? We're not, we're not saying that we can't make money without you guys paying more. What we're saying is we are making an investment in ourselves and we will need that help to offset those initial capital expenses. Um, additionally, it costs a lot of money to farm an ungodly amount of money to farm, and it's only getting more expensive. And when you talk about market volatility, people determine what we're paid for our product. We're the ones storing it, we're the ones making it, but we are 
actually don't have any control over how much we get paid for it. Um, so when we talk about consumers paying more, we're talking about a premium on top of that initial commodity payment. That is where the value is, and that's why we want to add value is so that the consumer can see value in the product. Thank you, Hallie. Will the next farm bill address that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll clarify that e EPA does not write the farm bill, but but <laughs> Congress is debating that right now, so it is a good, I mean, we don't lobby, we don't write the farm bill, but for those who are interested in farm bill policy, this is the year the new farm bill is being written, so it's good for you to mention it. Uh, all right, we're going to open this up for questions, and I got my first one right here. Hi, I'm Kashi Segel from Rataza. We support farmers. We buy food that you can't sell. Um, what is the lowest barrier to entry for a farmer who is transitioning from farming conventionally um, to a more regenerative, more sustainable practice? What is, how did you get into this? Were you always farming this way? Or what was that entry point for you? Because traditionally, this is also the way things have always been done within families. And so you're breaking some of those cultural norms and societal norms as well. So. How did you make that transition? What's the best way? I was motivated by climate change um, because in 2016, the EPA put out um, a report that said how climate change was going to affect each state. And ours, for Arkansas, it was less about heat and more about it's going to rain a lot and it's going to be dry a lot and you're not going to have a whole lot of in-between. And I knew that in the face of that, I was going to have to save money. And... I was given the opportunity um, through some friends at the USDA, uh, the National Resource Conservation Service, um, to, set, to look at how you can save money using regenerative practices. And what's, what's great about regenerative practices now, as opposed to the way that we've done things, is now we have so much technology we have varieties of soybeans and rice that can perform better in stressful conditions, and so we are now able to go back to not tilling the ground as much, not using as many herbicides. Um, the barrier of entry is money, and for me, it involved very large spreadsheets and determining what my return on investment was going to be. So if a farmer is willing to sit down and determine a return on investment of three, four, five, seven years and say, okay, here's how much equity I have, that being said, farmers make money by saving money in the good years to prepare for the bad, and that works when you have fewer bad years, but climate change causes more bad years. So not only are you dipping into that pocket to try to become more sustainable, you're also dipping into potentially that, that emergency fund. So it's going to be different for everybody. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing. This has been so insightful. My name is Victoria. I'm with um, Food Rescue Hero, which is a food recovery program. But um, I'm going to put on my dietitian hat just for a second, because when you talk about sustainable foods and paying more, I work with the public every single day. And what we are often hearing is, you know, I'm trying to move people beyond ultra processed foods and ideas of just back to real whole food, which is a huge progress. But the idea that what you're talking about changes the nutrient content of what these items are offering individuals. And when we see big, massive de deficits around vitamins and minerals because the soil has changed so significantly, I'm wondering if that's a point of focus or attention around, one, advocacy and awareness, but also premium. Because a lot of people I talk with will ask me, is, does it, is it worth buying a grass-fed um, item over something else. And people are very confused by organic versus a lot of this information that's out there. It's not translating to the consumer. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, that we're, I'm, I agree. Um, food is more, there are, aren't enough studies, but there are some that show that the nutrient profiles in food grown in better soils are higher. And I think that we, you know, there's, we're starting to see more of those prescription um, uh, produce programs, right, where doctors are recommending food over medications. And I think that, I don't know if it's more of a policy 
question, if we need to bring this into how you know we're working with our departments of public health maybe. But again, I think we saw a great um, union between EPA, USDA, and FDA around food loss and waste. So I think that that same coalition, it'd be great to start talking about these issues as well. And I do think it is a, still somewhat of a research question to ensure that the right research is happening to be able to make that linkage between climate smart agriculture or conservation or regenerative, whatever term you like, regenerative practices and then the nutrient content of the food. Um, I have started to see some studies in that space, but it's not super prevalent yet. So um, could be uh, a topic for future conversations, both with federal agencies and also universities, perhaps. Hi, my name is Rose, and I'm the head of sustainability at an online grocery retailer called Misfits Market. Um, but my question is actually around um, what's coming next out of the North American Leaders Summit, which Dana mentioned in her opening remarks. But I'm curious, we know that um, food waste and loss is a top priority for Biden, um, but we don't necessarily know what to expect next and how the EPA might be involved in any follow-up. Um, is there any, any insights you can share, Rod? a good question. Um, so I don't know what specifically is going to be on the North American Leaders Summit agenda. I, I am also I am looking ahead to things like the next COP, um, a, a, which I think is going to be in the UAE in, in November, December, and um, just a week ago at the Aim for Climate event in DC, which um, Secretary Vilsack from USDA, leaders from UAE began to look ahead at sort of the food and ag agenda for COP. So there's a lot of um, activity around this space right now. Um, over a year ago, uh, my boss, Administrator Regan, had a really interesting meeting with Cindy McCain when she was at the time um, the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Food and Ag Organization, specifically about food loss and food waste. So at the global level, these things are starting to emerge, I think, in the conversations. Um, it's one of the things I'm taking back from this conference is to see how can we better reflect that in some of the international discussions. But I can't predict for that particular meeting what's gonna be on the agenda, but I um, certainly have appreciated the input I've heard just from the last 24 hours about how critical it is for that to show up on those global agendas. Oh, <laughs> all right. So much pressure to be um, Anna Hammond, and I just, your presentation has been unbelievable and so clear and actually brought me to tears at the beginning, just the clarity of it. Um, the question maybe right for you, Rod, again, is is there's $5 billion being put toward change. You know, what percentage of that is toward the, trans the cost of transition, and how are you or the government targeting this kind of work, which is so clearly making a difference, not only from an environmental perspective, but an economic perspective and a you know living perspective and you know nutrition uh, additionally. Yeah, and I'll I'll mention I should I should sort of create a little bit of a greater context, which is the climate pollution reduction grant. I, I mentioned it specifically just because there's some some key activity around that right now, and the states are developing their plans, which is why I'm putting it on folks' radar. But actually, it's a much bigger investment than that. USDA received $20 billion through the Inflation Reduction Act for um, climate smart agriculture practices to go to fund some of the very things that Hallie was talking about, um, which uh, knowing that, uh, that, such an interesting moment because I know that many private sector actors in the room here are also trying to find ways to invest back in their supply chains, but the federal government is now coming forward in a big way because of the IRA. Um, to partner in that space. Um, we also are standing up something called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, um, which is intended to help move, it's a $27 billion fund that's helping, trying to um, move private sector, match and leverage private sector capital into the space. It's not all food and ag, it's not all food loss and food waste, but I just wanna make a more fundamental point, which is that the Inflation Reduction Act is the largest investment in climate change in US history, maybe in global history. It, it, it was 400 some, billion dollars. And if we can't find a way to sort of maximize and take advantage of this moment, shame on us. So we have to work together to make sure that these various pots of money, whether it's EPA or USDA, are going to help make this uh, long-term impact that we've all been working towards for so long. Um, so the USDA, uh, right now we're waiting uh, to hear how the money is going to be spent um, and where, because it's allocated by county. Uh, a state and county. Um, historically, the EQIP program, which is how we get money for sustainable pro projects, um, has been underfunded 
in our area, so we're kind of waiting to hear about that. Um, something I really want, and maybe someone can tell me, uh, how I can tell them how they should spend their money. Because I, I really have some great ideas for them. <laughs> Nobody's asked me yet, but that's what I offer. She's very good. <laughs> uh, I'm thinking about John's uh, question to us earlier about are we willing to pay more. And I think that's, that may work in this room, but I don't think that's a question we want to be asking the American people when they're worried about food inflation. But I think it is a good question. Uh, there are questions that we should be asking policymakers, and some folks brought, a, uh, brought up the Farm Bill. My organization uh, is an advocacy organization. We're focused on the Farm Bill right now. And you're talking about we should Farm Bill. It would be really helpful if you told me exactly what in the Farm Are we talking about conservation funding? Are we talking about research? Are we talking about the commodity title? What, we, what exactly should we be telling policymakers that this is what they need to invest in to get more farmers uh, to farm like, like Haley. So I have to be exceedingly careful. I'm actually prohibited from, uh, you know, sort of suggesting administration positions on future legislation that is not yet written. But, uh, but you, you know the things that you care about as an advocate, as an organization. The House and Senate Agriculture Committees have the pen right now, and it's a matter of going up and, and having those conversations. And, and sometimes I think we get so caught in the the sort of um, details of well which title does this belong in and which program which pot of money you know you take those priorities to the hill and, and have those conversations and um, and ask them to help figure it out with you right um, so it's the the food, the farm bill is only reauthorized every five years as you know which means it's not going to be until again until 2028 so it is a window that is closing Yeah, I think one of the things that we need to look at right now also is just the, the, the true makeup of the committees. You have Senator Stabenow, the chair of the Ag Committee on the Senate side, who's retiring. She has no chips to hold. She is going to spend them all. And so every time you can have a conversation with her office about things that are important to you, whether that is incentivizing the kind of transition that Hallie is trying to make on her farm, or looking at it through the lens of what food loss and waste means in the climate scenario, which this administration has obviously yeah. demonstrated their commitment to, those things are important right now. The activity on the ground, the implementation of those funds is going to be the first step on us getting onto the road that leads to the kind of change that we want to see and need. But it is a, um, um, I, I don't know if you've heard this before, but Congress is a little bit dysfunctional right now. <laughs> and the, the thing that really has to happen is you need to talk to your members. Members vote the way of their district. This is one of those really interesting pieces. 90, over 90% 90 vote the way of their district. I, you know, ger gerrymandering of district boundaries is one thing I love to talk about, but we won't have time for that. We're down to our last minute. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. I also want to thank all of you for staying. You probably, some of you probably have to bolt out of here for a plane. Um, but I also want you to, to, to take this and be, have it be a call to action. Have it be one of those pieces where you, like I, am going to do, inform yourself on what those other things are that we can do. Refed has some great tools. The Insight uh, tool is incredible. Utilize it. USDA, EPA have good tools also, specific to food loss and waste. So go and check out what they have. But I also want to say that you know we have um, a break coming up right now. 
So go and get yourself a snack, and, and as Rod did, try not to caffeinate yourself uh, quite as much. <laughs> but be ready for the afternoon, because you're going you're gonna to really enjoy the, the ending of this summit. So again, thank you all for your participation. Thank you.